Today in Israel and for Jewish people around the world, an annual cycle of holidays provide welcome timeouts from the routines of life. By rest and remembrance, their ancient Jewish culture is renewed. But do these God-appointed festivals recorded by Moses hold meaning only for the people of Israel? The nation of Israel, whose calendar reminds its people of the appointed times of the Lord, times of rest and remembrance, specific times that look back and times that point to the future. Clustered in the spring and the fall, these holy feast days are tied to the agricultural cycle of Israel. There are a total of seven holidays based on a lunar calendar that follows the phases of the moon, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Then we have this other feast in verse 15, Feast of Weeks. Verse 15, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. So what is that speaking of? What we just covered. The day after the Sabbath where you offer the first fruits. Here's the first fruits, Lord. Count seven weeks from that point. From the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. That's what we talked about. So you bring the sheaf, you say, Lord, this is yours. This belongs to you, God. I worship you that you've provided for me. Okay, seven weeks from that moment. Verse 16, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. So what's going on here? So from that day of first fruits, seven weeks, 50 days from that place, they were to come now during this time of harvest and offer new grain. So up to this point in their season of harvest, they were to bring another offering as thanksgiving to the Lord. And recognizing that God is the one who sustained them. God is the one who's provided all these things up to this point. And no, notice the emphasis, new grain. This is not the same as what we talked about in the first fruits. This is not the, the, the blossoming there in the beginning. No, this is something that's this is talking about a different kind of harvest. And they were to come, bring this before the Lord, and they were to say, again, we recognize your blessing. Now, let me read this to you. You don't have to turn there. But in Exodus 23, 16, because some of these feasts have different names, and some people can get confused. But a synonymous feast name to this is in Exodus 23, 16, called the Feast of Harvest. The Feast of Harvest. And how fitting is that name in light of what it means prophetically? The Feast of Harvest. In the New Testament, does anybody know what this feast is called? Pentecost, meaning 50th. So 50 days, Pentecost. Okay, question. When did Jesus raise from the, the dead? The first fruits, right? Celebration of first fruits. When was the Holy Spirit poured out on the church? 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave. What happened on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 came. Your harvest. Harvest. A harvest of souls were presented on that day. Do you see what the Lord is trying to say here? A new harvest, an ingathering, a bringing in of souls. And someone interpret, because there's something unique about this feast. Have you noticed in the reading, when they were to offer the bread, it was a specific type of bread. Leavened bread. Hmm? Leavened. But unleavened means without sin and you want to bring leavened bread? I'm still debating about this, wrestling with it, but I had heard this 
and read this interpretation of it, that the leaven speaks of the fact that in light of the prophetic implications and interpretation that the church is still leavened to some degree, that it still has sin. But because of what Christ has done, the Holy Spirit allows us to come before the throne of grace because of the spilled blood for us. Amen. And so here's leavened bread. And this is, this is the, that part I like, I understand. This is the part where it's a little bit of a stretch. You have two loaves, Jew, Gentile. Still wrestling with that. But the idea there about leaven is pretty powerful. That the Holy Spirit poured out on sinful men, but because of what Christ has done for us, he can seal us and empower us and bring us into a relationship with God, adopting us, crying out for us. But the main point is the harvest, the harvest that fell on this day, that as they recognize it in the physical, in the new covenant, it's spiritual. People are coming in. People are coming in. And this is a beautiful thing. If we can put up that, Line a feast up again, please. You have Passover, Jesus' death. You have unleavened bread, speaking about the believer that's cleansing himself from sin, but also the timing where Jesus was buried. You have first fruits, where Jesus did raise from the grave. And you have Pentecost. You have the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, where 50 days later, souls came into the kingdom of God. In a mighty way. New grain offered before the Lord. Here's the problem. We have three feasts left. Three feasts left. And there is nothing in the New Testament that indicates any fulfillment to these feasts. There's nothing about these feasts in which we can point to like we have. have we, can we all agree that we pointed to New Testament scriptures that concretely state that these things are fulfillment in Christ's ministry up to this point? Now we come to this point and we go, well, there's nothing I can point to that has been fulfilled unless these feasts are speaking about something yet to be fulfilled. Let me put a disclaimer here. Let me put a disclaimer here. I am not going even to flirt with the idea of naming dates of events that are going to take place from this point on with the Bible study. And if anybody does claim any dates about when Christ is going to do this or when Christ is going to do that, it's pretty dangerous. In fact, people have gone to the extreme where they have really proclaimed these kind of things and they got themselves in trouble. And they have the audacity to say, oh, I, I misheard that date. It's actually this date. And that is not what I'm doing here. But nevertheless, the events that are going to be seen in the rest of these feats are un... There's no doubt that they have some kind of prophetic whisper in them. You can take that down. Thank you. When you come to the end of the Feast of Weeks, it comes to the end of the Spring Feast. And then there's this interval time between the Feast of Weeks and the next Feast. There's, there's this gap. And then we come into these Fall Feasts, and they're all found in the same month. And I believe that that gap between the Feast of Weeks and the next Feast speaks about a certain age. What age do you think that is speaking of? The church age. Souls are still coming in. There is still a harvest. People are still hearing the gospel. God is slow. Slow. In judgment because he wants all to reach repentance. And so if you want to know where we are in this calendar... We're right here, the church age. So what are we waiting for next? 